Claire, thank you for the Chick-fil-A mask, which I'll now take off. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. It's ingrained. So uh, good to be with you today. If you're um, joining us on the World Wide Web, otherwise known as Facebook today, please add a comment. Love to see who's out there. And, uh, but it's, if it's a bad comment about the sermon, just keep it to yourself. But just say hi at least, okay? So it's good to be here. And, and we do pray for Patrick and Jenny and the family as they have a little time off. And it's a pleasure to be able to share today. So a few years ago, uh, before we moved in our other house, our hot water heater broke and we needed a new hot water heater. So Jenny and I ran over to Lowe's to pick out the hot water heater, you know, shop for a hot water heater, right? It's great fun. So we found one, bought it. Well, it came with installation included. So the next day I waited around and uh, a plumber showed up who Lowe's had sent to install the hot water heater. He was kind of a small wiry guy. I'll never forget him. He was real small, kind of wiry and had long blonde hair. And uh, so he got to work on the hot water heater there in the garage. Well, I'm kind of, my dad always taught me because he used to work on small engines. He said, you know, it's more if you watch. So I said, you know, I'll let this guy do his thing. So I went in the house so he could do his thing without me watching him. Like I was an expert anyway. So I went in the house a little bit later, finished this thing, he knocked on the door. I went back out in the garage to <clears throat> inspect his work because I'm such an expert on hot water heaters. And said, well, it looks pretty good. So we talked, had a conversation. We stood there for a little bit, small talk about the importance of hot water and hot water heaters and the weather and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden he looks at me and he says, are you a prepper? And I thought, okay, Claire will tell you, I am not the hippest guy when it comes to emo the latest emojis and jargon and all the cool things. And I thought he was asking me if I was preppy. And I didn't really want to give that answer to my plumber. And so I asked for a little clarification about what he meant. And he said, you know, are you prepared for the invasion? A prepper. Well, I wasn't exactly sure how to answer that. So I found in talking to my plumber prepper that there's a whole culture out there, unbeknownst to me, who have built literal fortresses in their rural communities, rural refuges, stocked them with a lifetime supply of non-perishable food, all the toilet paper they can buy, and a lot of weapons, okay? So I was not aware of this fortress mentality that was out there in society. It was kind of news to me. Well, of course, I felt really ill-prepared. I mean, I've got a couple of shotguns, Got a 22 rifle my dad bought 50 years ago. I thought, well, Judy and I probably have a few cans of green beans in the pantry. But otherwise, we were in serious trouble. We were not really preppers. <clears throat> so we had this conversation a little bit, and I thought, oh boy. And he looks at me again, a little deep in thought, and he says, and let me ask you this. What do you believe about the zombie apocalypse? It's a true story. It really happened staying in my garage, didn't it? I told you the story, right? And, and he said, what do you think about the zombie apocalypse? Well, now I really felt bad because it occurred to me, I had never really developed a theology or belief about the zombie apocalypse. I mean, I wasn't exactly sure. I thought he was joking. He was completely serious. I didn't know what to think about the zombie apocalypse, but then I felt a little bit better because then he said to me, he said, well, it's okay. I haven't really decided what I believe about it yet either. So I thought, boy, I'm out of that one. Well, I was kind of out of places to go. I didn't have much to say about being a prepper or the zombie apocalypse. So I decided, you know what, here's my opportunity. So I said to him, look, I will tell you this. I, I, am, I guess you could call me a prepper in a way, but in a little bit different way. I'm prepared for what happens, but probably a little bit different than what you are. Before I could finish, he interrupted me and he goes, I know. You've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, haven't you? I have too. That's about all I can remember about that conversation with my, my prepper plumber, but I've never forgotten it. But I will say lately, 20, 2020 has made me think a lot about my prepper plumber. I'm thinking, you know, maybe he was on to something. You know, maybe I need to get prepared here for what's happening. 
One of my favorite memes, and there's a lot of these memes out there. One of my favorite memes so far of 2020 is this guy, Earthling, standing there, and there's a spacecraft, must be Martians, hovering over him, and he looks up at him and he says, I will literally pay you to take me. <laughs> Have you felt that way about 2020? Well, in April of 1521, Martin Luther was called before the religious leaders of his day and the emperors to give an account for the new heresy that he was teaching all over the world, what he was calling justification by faith alone. He was brought into a room and his foes spread out all of his writings in front of him and said, now are you ready to recant from what you've said? They said, we'll give you the night to think about it. So Luther went back to his room that night to pray and read and think about it, and his Bible literally fell open to Psalm 46. And he began to read that magnificent song, which is titled Confidence in God. As Luther read that psalm, his confidence in God and what God had for him began to build and well up in his life, and he went in the next morning, and the rest is history. We call it the Reformation. And the story is told many times that during the dangers and the height of the Reformation when his life was continually threatened, that Luther would turn to his good friend Philip Melanchthon and would say to him, come brother, let us see, sing the 46th Psalm and let the devil do his worst. Because he knew from the 46th Psalm that there was ultimate confidence in God. Let's look at what brought Luther such confidence and what we can turn to today, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. She will, God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease the end of the earth, to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Unlike many passages of scripture and many stories throughout the Bible, we really don't have a lot of context for this psalm, but we obviously can tell from whatever was happening here that there's a need for God's strength, for God's confidence. There's a need for that reassurance. But here's what we do know. And Luther had it right. This is a song. It's a song. It has three verses that are probably separated even in your Bible. Verse, the first stanza are verses 1 through 3 of this psalm. And then verses 4 through 6 form the second stanza. And verses 8 through 10, the third stanza, with verses 7 and 11 something about 7 and 11, isn't it? It's not just a convenience store. It's a great... But verses 7 and 11 are the course, the refrain. And then after each of those, of those verses, those three verses, there's that word selah, which is a pause. It's a musical term, actually. It means pause. It could even mean do it with exclamation. Pause for effect. So between each of those verses... But here's what we also know about this, which is what brought Luther so much strength in his time. And what we can turn to today is, this is a psalm of confidence about God. Now, I will tell you, after all my years of seminary, I probably didn't learn everything I should have learned. And there was probably a lot more that I didn't learn that I should have. But there was one truth that I walked away from seminary with for sure. And it rang with me and stuck with me, and it's this. It's not about me. It is about God. And this passage is a reminder that it is not about me. It is not about my strength. 
It's about my confidence in God. It's not about me. The Bible is a book about God. He is both its subject and its author. And while it may not be about me, it is for me. And right now, I need this psalm more than ever. As I've kind of grown a little older and, well, now I would say lost my hair, but I did that a long time ago. But I, I will tell you, more and more of my study is, is confessional. I, I go to scripture that I need. I go to words that I need from the Bible, and I need this passage. I need it now. Psalm 46, in, in many ways, is our prepper handbook, as my plumber might say. It's our prepper handbook. It tells us that our confidence belongs in God. It, it shows us that God is protecting us through those natural disasters. Look at what he says. Though the earth should change. Is the earth changing? Though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and though the mountains quake with swelling pride, when there is a natural disaster around you, when the earth quakes, when the waters foam and boil, maybe a hurricane. Oh, we've never seen a hurricane season like this one. When those things happen, God is our protection in natural disasters. But he is also our protection, the psalmist says, during national disasters. Look at what he says. He says during those times of national catastrophe and chaos that there is a city of God the holy and dwelling places, places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God would help her, will help her when morning dawns. The nations make an uproar. Kingdoms totter. He raises his voice and the earth melted. No matter what happens in the national calamities and chaos, and no matter what happens during natural disasters, there is a God. And the psalm reminds us he is in control, that even the earth melts at the sound of his voice. Nothing happens among the affairs of humanity, among our nations, that God is not aware of. The psalm reminds us that God is in the midst. Now, the middle portions of this psalm are bracketed by a couple of verses that are two of the most memorable verses in all of the psalms, the ones that we probably remember and think of most when we think of Psalm 46. The writer says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Who needs a refuge? Refugees. And we are refugees. We are strangers in a strange land. We are wayfaring strangers. This world is not our home. We are refugees in this place and we need a refuge. There are many people who think that this might even be, might have even been a reference to Numbers 35. And in Numbers 35, God instructs Moses when they enter the land to, for the Levites to build these, these cities of refuge. It's a fascinating part of Jewish history. But if you read that, what it was said was that it gives the exact example. If someone's cutting a tree and the head of the ax flies off and it kills someone, is he guilty of murder? And so the Israelites were instructed to, to build these cities of refuge where someone could go until their guilt or innocence, until they could be established whether or not this person was indeed guilty. Psalm 35, 15 says that this is God's instructions, that there are to be six cities that shall be for refuge to the sons of Israel and for the alien, the sojourner among them, that any who kills a person unintentionally may flee. These were to be those places of safety that you could go for refuge. And no doubt, all of us, all of us are guilty. We can go to this place of refuge that God gives us, and we can hide under the protection of Jesus Christ. There is a place of refuge. And it's not necessarily fortified with toilet paper, guns, and canned food. Amen? He says, God is our strength. You know what? Now, now, sometimes you read scripture, you've got to read what it says, but you've got to remember what it doesn't say. If God is my strength, then who is not my strength? Me. 
God is my strength. Zechariah 4, 6, it's a verse we know. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And a passage that has always spoken to me, though I haven't always really let it sink in, is that beautiful passage that Paul wrote to the Corinthians in which he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Try running for office on that one. Therefore, Paul writes, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And then the refrain of these verses, of this passage, remind us that the Lord of hosts is with us. By the way, when you hear that song that we sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, that Martin Luther wrote, this is where it came from. Lord Sabaoth is the Lord of hosts. That's what it means. The armies of God. Think about that. Confidence in God because the armies of God, the Lord, the armies of the Lord of hosts stand with us and fight for us. So we have confidence. Verse 1 ends with the assurance that God is a very present help in times of trouble. Now look at that. He's a very present help. Some, some translations of the Bible even footnote that, that it could be translated abundantly available for help. God is abundantly available for help. He is ready. He's there. Here's, a, here's one thing to keep in mind, though. God is not your 911. All right? 911 means you call them and they come. God's always there. He's there. And yet sometimes we want to fight in our own strength. Scripture reminds us that he is our very present help in times of trouble. Or as another psalm put it, Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, thou art with me. God is with me. In the other end of this bracket, in verse 10, cease striving and know that I am God. That's the New American Standard translation. See striving and know that I am God. A lot of those, a lot of translators will render that, be still and know that I am God. There must be a connection here, I think, between being still and knowing God. You know, it's hard to get to know someone through a conversation if you do all the talking. Be still and know that I am God. It doesn't tell us to quit. It says to rely on him. He is our strength. Be still and know that. Habakkuk 2.20 affirms that where it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. Can you imagine what it would be like if the earth were silent and waited on God and listened for God's voice? It's a lesson that Job discovered. So thinking about this message and where I am personally in my own life, I, I almost did a Job. Job is probably one of my favorite books of the Bible. I, you shouldn't say that, right? Say, which is your favorite ribeye or barbecue, right? So, but, you know, Job discovered this, didn't he? His friends had given him all this great advice, and finally when you get to the 38th chapter of the book of Job, he is so spiraled down into self-pity that you know, there's nowhere to go. But, you know, it's kind of hard to blame him, isn't it? I mean, everything he'd been through and all the difficulties he, he had. But the point of the book of Job that God was trying to make is, you know what? Sometimes bad things just happen to good people. It just, sometimes those things do happen to all of us. None of us are immune from pain and suffering, are we? At some level, at some point, in our lives, and in all of humanity, no literature of any kind has ever struggled with this issue of pain and suffering like the book of Job struggled with it. And the other lesson that we learn from his friends is, you know what, sometimes those, those nice little religious memes that you see on social media that have all the right answers, yet sometimes they're not really right. As a friend told me years ago, for for every complicated question, there's always an easy answer. 
it's usually wrong. And the same is so often true with our lives spiritually. There are always difficulties that we struggle with, but if you always just turn to the easy answer, it's probably not the best answer, is it? God shows up and says, let me give you the right answer. And this, to me, visually, is just such a strong visual in Scripture where in this whirlwind, God speaks to Job and he gives him this right answer. He says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? (laughs) I'll raise our hands at that one, y'all. Now, gird up your loins like a man, God tells Job, and I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. In other words, be still and know that I am God. You are not. And when I look at this passage and I see that incredible confidence that I gain from being a child of God, it's, a, it's, a, it's really kind of a relief to me to realize I'm not God after all, am I? He is. And he is the source of my strength. You can summarize, I think, this psalm with three simple ideas, and I'll give them to you. First of all, God is our home. Secondly, God is our help. And third, God is our hope. There you go. You know I had to get to alliteration somewhere there, right? Well, remember that. First of all, God is our home. He is that place we go for safety, isn't he? And during this time of self-isolation and quarantine, well, I've kind of had a little bit. I love my home, right? But it's just me and the dog. Day after day, Judy goes to work. I've had a lot of self-isolation. And yet, God is that refuge, that home, that place I can go, spend time with him. Here's my practical application and question for you. Do you have that place? Where is there a place where you can go and be still and know that he is God? And just spend time with God and read his word. God is your home. He's our home, that place we go for comfort and safety. He is our help. He is our help. He is there for us. So, you know, what is it in your life that God uses to strengthen and sustain you? And again, I've thought a lot about that during times of these times of loneliness and when we're by ourselves. What is it that God uses to strengthen and sustain me? And I hit on this thing, you know. In my life, it's a lot of the same things he used when I was a new Christian. Reading his word. Spending time in fellowship. Worshiping him. Those are all the things we've been taught since we were a wee little Christian. And those are the things that also strengthen and sustain us. And, and, and song. Music. How many of you, you're just in sitting there and God brings a song into your heart and it gives you that strength, it gives you that help that you need. God giving you that strength and help that you need. And I'm not going to sing any that mean a lot to me. Better. And then third, God is our hope. It's put very simply, know that he is God. Know that he is God. He is our hope. We are not our own hope. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And God has all power. He is our hope. I love the way Corey Tim Boom said it one time. There is no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. He is our hope. The source of our confidence. <clears throat> George Young was a rural preacher and a carpenter what we would call today a bivocational pastor. He humbly served the Lord on a meager salary, always serving small rural churches wherever he went throughout his ministry, always living in parsonages or rented homes. And finally, he had saved enough money from his meager salary that he was able to build his own home. Being a carpenter, bivocational, he built it himself. Well, Brother Young was away some years later, after they had settled into their new home, he was away leading revival services at a nearby community. And some thugs, some ruffians from the community where he served the church, who didn't like his gospel preaching, showed up and burned his house to the ground. Total loss, every bit of it. No one was there, no one was injured, but it ruined, destroyed their home that they'd worked so far, so hard for. This poor rural pastor, rather than being bitter, or angry with God, instead wrote a beautiful hymn. 
Years later, there was a young immigrant in the United States, a man from Scandinavia named Haldor Lilinus. You've been around Christian music very long, and you look down at the bottom, you'll see many of the pieces of music have been published by Lilinus Publishing Company. It became one of the largest Christian publishers of music in history. Haldor Lilinus had immigrated to the United States. His first year here, he said, was miserable, it was tough. He didn't speak the language, but a, a lady befriended him and began to teach him English as his second language. Sound familiar? And through her witness and her work with him, she, he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. And he said that all those years he knew her, she would hum this song and sing this little song, God Leads Us Along. When he became successful with his publishing company, he decided he wanted to find the man who wrote that song, George Young. He looked all over and finally found uh, George Young, but unfortunately he had died. But he found Reverend Young's widow, who was aged by that time, and when he found her in this little town, he talked to her and told her of the importance this song had played in comforting him and his growth in Christ. As she was so delightful and happy, an old woman by that time, living in a poor house. She said, you know, God has been so good to me through my life. He's blessed me in so many ways, and he's used me everywhere he's taken me. I love that story. It's not a glamorous story. It's not one you've probably ever heard. But it's a simple story about confidence in God and God's leading and God leading us along. And the song itself gives me great comfort and assurance. This song, in many ways for me, leads me home. It gives me help and confidence in God. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives us a song in the night season and all the day long. 